Hi, everyone. I was just saying, I don't think I know like everyone in the room, but I think probably a lot of you, like, it's kind of preaching to the choir a little bit. So, uh, and the other thing is I've got, uh, Democracy Club did loads and loads of stuff for the election, and I probably don't have enough time to talk about all of it, so I'm going to skim over loads and loads of stuff, but apologies in advance, and, like, come and talk to me about what, uh, if you're more interested later on. So, all right, so I'm Sim. I'm not showing my screen. It was working. No, it's not. Yeah. Uh, and I run Democracy Club, and there's a few people here who like are very big volunteers of that. We got a lot of volunteers to help out with our projects. Uh, what we do improve the democratic process uh, through kind of volunteering, building tools, and uh, collaborating with like-minded organisations. And here's some of the projects we ran over the general election. Um, so what I'm going to do is say. In general, with democracy stuff, there's lots of people doing loads of interesting stuff in the democratic space. There's some people working on like voting reform, or new ways of doing voting, or talking about online voting, or talking about replacing parliament, or the laws, or like loads of kind of really big things. There's a really good space for that debate. But what we wanted to do was start really small and say there's very, very basic things of democracy. Like, you know, it's kind of quite old-fashioned in a lot of ways, and there's lots of good things about that. But you know, going to a community centre and writing it across on a bit of paper is like not a digital thing, and Let's look at if there's ways we can, like the, what's the low hanging fruit in that space that is the first digital stuff we can do. Uh, and yeah, so we have a long way to go before online voting is something that's just something we can implement. It's like <laughs> we need to we need to do loads of other stuff. Uh, general elections. So we first started working on the 2015 general election about a year ago properly. And uh, there's interesting stuff about it. There's no single owner of the election, which is really interesting. So Parliament does some stuff. Uh, Councils do some stuff, the Electoral Commission do some stuff, and it's not really obvious kind of like to the citizen like who's doing what, it just sort of happens. <coughs> um, because of that, there's no central source information, so we see that councils have a load of information on their websites, uh, the Electoral Commission does, Parliament does, uh, again, there's the same kind of thing. Uh, and of course, because of that, there's just PDFs all over the place, and that's frustrating. Uh, the first problem we tried to solve was how to find who was standing for election. This is like point one on the thing that should be digital, is working out who you're able to vote for. Um, that's really hard to do, or it was really hard to do. These were two, two screenshots I took from kind of January time, I suppose. Uh, if you search for like who, who are my candidates, uh, The Guardian gave you this. This is the top result of The Guardian, which just says no longer updated. That's gone. And then Wikipedia had a list of candidates, but it was actually wrong, um, which is a shame. I could have gone and fixed that, and like you know that, that happened. But like, it's kind of clunky, and like a table on a Wikipedia page is, you know, it's good, but there's probably a better way of presenting candidates. Um, this is what the councils do. Uh, they do it about three weeks before the election starts. Uh, there's 450 councils, and they publish. Table. So this is my constituency, and as you can see, it's it's like similar to that list there, but it's kind of updated. It's just their names, the the address if they don't live in the constituency, and like a description of the party. This is interesting because it's it doesn't have to be the party name; it can just be a description of the political party. Um, so you still don't know like who the person is standing for. It's just like a, a, a description of the party. Anyway, this is on my council's website. Um, uh, three weeks before the election, and it doesn't really tell me anything about how I might have an informed vote for one of these people. Um, this is a weird lag on this. Uh, this is another example of, uh, what's this show? <laughs> yeah, there's no party here. There's just some people's names and some people's addresses, and like this is the state-provided way of telling you who's standing for election, so that's kind of <coughs> completely incomprehensible. Uh, a bit worse, Birmingham decided to do a scan of a print of the table, so you can see the nice like artifacts of scanning. Uh, that's not very digital. Uh, so what we did is we built a website called Your Next MP, which uh, crowdsourced all of this. Uh, we got it from the statement of nominations later on, but they're only published, as I said, three weeks before the election. Uh, the, the data is there. The parties know who's going to be standing a long time before that. The press know all that kind of stuff. Um, and in fact, there were loads of stories about candidates being deselected, you know, months before <laughs> these nominations were out. So it's obviously kind of of interest in the public domain that candidates are, are selected or deselected, but there's no information about them. So uh, we crowdsourced uh, all of them we could find. Um, and this is what a kind of later version of our website looks like. So we got like photos, we pulled in 
Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, like all of the kind of like surrounding things. So rather than just a list of names and some parties, it kind of who are these actual people? If you don't know who to vote for, you can go and start researching. You can follow them on Twitter. You can go and talk to them on Twitter, all that kind of stuff. Uh, we did quite well. We got about uh, four and a half million page views. Um, election day were really popular. We had like 2,000 concurrent users and uh, well, you can read the numbers there. Uh, but kind of more excitingly than people using our, thi our thing alone, we get we like made an open data set, which was a, a attribution share alike data set that lots and lots of people started using. And in fact, one problem we found with it is that because we just made it open and free to use, we didn't know who'd used it. So we were kind of googling around and would find like some website made a tool like, oh, what do you think of your candidates? And then we'd find out they were actually using our data, but they hadn't told us about it. So kind of tracking who used it was kind of difficult. Uh, but the ones we do know about, this is the most exciting one. Uh, we got Google as a partner, and they pulled in our data set. So you can, whereas at the start of the thing, I said, I Googled, who can I vote for? And it gave me some really bad information from The Guardian. Google built a widget for us. So when you search, who can I vote for? You had this thing, you put in where you live, and then it just gave you the list embedded in Google search for who you can vote for. So like that's our biggest kind of headline success story of like, we took this data that's normally in PDFs, we got it on the Google. And actually on election data, it was on the homepage. They linked this widget on the homepage. Um, this kind of shows the, the, the need. So the dots there of, um, is the day that the nomination papers are released. So the day that kind of the best version of the state provided data is released. And you can see we had from over here, we had loads of users. Sorry, there's no numbers on this graph. I probably cropped them off or something. Uh, but the numbers are big. Like, <laughs> just trust me. It's not like five people. <laughs> um, yeah, so for reuse, as I said, we had a, a, a CSV snapshot of the data generator every 15 minutes. It was updating quite frequently at some points, like people adding email addresses all the time and all that kind of stuff. Um, it was formatted. The back end was done in the My Society's Popolo format, which is, well, not My Society's, the Poplar Foundation's Popolo format, which is a way of storing people as they write to organizations and doing loads of kind of complex, uh, there's loads of educators, like people change their names or they have weird titles or they have alternative names and that kind of stuff. So that was how the whole website was based. It was kind of built off that, and the export was in that format. Um, the nice thing about that is there's loads of tools that they've written that just read in from that format. So you could have built a write your candidates tool by literally like pasting the URL of the API into the hosted tool and then having it exist, which is really exciting. Uh, yeah, the back end was MySociety's Poppet, which is a, a, a software implementation of that thing. It's a kind of node Mongo-y kind of thing that does that. Um, and what we're doing next is taking this to other countries, which is kind of exciting. So hopefully we're going to have a, a front end to who are my candidates in every country across the world. Off the back, so the interesting thing is like what we were hope, what we thought originally was that um, uh, we would just crowdsource the database, have a data set there, and then people, you know, we leave it lying around, and then some people would go and make some really cool stuff out of it. And some people did make some stuff off it, which is which is very exciting. Most of them looked a little bit like the website that we made, which was like a list of candidates, which is you know which is cool, but it wasn't like really kind of like bold, exciting, crazy projects uh, out there. So we did a couple of things. That first of all, we just decided to make our website. We've, we realised that our website was actually the website that people wanted to <laughs> to like to look at, and we were getting a load of traffic. So we made our website better and more user friendly. Um, we also had several side projects that used the data. So we had like when you've got a list of candidates, you kind of want to know what you can do with them, and it turns out they'll go to public debates before an election called hustings. So we made a directory of hustings, uh, so you kind of know know where you can go and meet them. Uh, we asked them to upload their CV, which is a kind of interesting, like another iteration on, on the council run, just a list of names, and now we give you names and a photo and Twitter profile and stuff. But the CV is like, if you frame becoming an MP as applying for a job, then a CV is really important. Um, it's only one data point, but it's still significantly more than we have. Um, election mentions is really interesting. So the, the database was sourced. We had like source URLs. Um, for all of the edits for your XMP, so it was all, all we could back it up. Um, and someone went and uh, scraped basically all of the news articles, because they're normally news articles that are saying this candidate's been selected, scraped all the news articles and uh, pulled out kind of extracted quotes from the candidates. So you could say, X said, you know, 
they oppose this or something, and then you could pull those all out, uh, and we m put them on electionmentions.com. And election leaflets is a way of crowdsourcing election leaflets that the candidates are sending and like having that exposed in a kind of transparent, open archive that's built in real time. Uh, all those sites got, got a load of, I mean, yeah, we had a load of candidates, a load of leaflets, uh, quite a lot of CVs. I'm kind of surprised at how many CVs we got in the end. Um, it's kind of exciting. Um, a thousand public debates, um, all the hustings. Uh, I've got an anecdote from, from, from my local hustings. I added one to the site. And because of that, a whole housing association discovered it. And they like sent it around internally. So 30 more people turned up to the hustings than they were expecting, which meant not everyone could fit in. But one of the people who turned up who they weren't expecting was one of the candidates who hadn't been invited. And he only found out about the hustings because of the site. So he turned up at the table and was like, well, I'm going to just sit here anyway and take part because it's kind of, kind of funny. Uh, yeah, and then loads of press mentions. We scraped basically every every newspaper and local newspaper and load of blogging sites and got loads of mentions of candidates. So there's a kind of really rich data set there of, uh, oh, it's all text, but it's kind of like you, you can extract out loads of interesting stuff out of that text. There's a similar story for polling stations as with candidates. So again, every council uh, maintains where you should vote. So we kind of, we fix the problem of like who who's on the ballot paper, but it's still quite hard to find out where that ballot paper is going to be. Um, you get a polling card, that's fine. A lot of people lose their polling card. Um, if you've got it pinned on the fridge and then like you go to work and forget to bring it with you and you want to vote on the way back from work, you just like it's really annoying. Uh, on election day, we saw hundreds of people just tweeting that they want to vote, but they have no idea where to go. Um, you know, so there's a problem here. So we can make the case for saying you need to be able to Google, you know, where do I vote or where's my polling station? And in fact, I think that was like the third most Google search term in the UK on polling day is like, where's my polling station? And there's no answer for it. There's no answer online at all because again, it's like 450 councils publish PDFs that are incomprehensible for people to do. Uh, so we need to try and fix that. Uh, we tried our best. We basically failed this time around. We did an FOI to every council. Lots of them didn't respond at all, which is, a bit worrying for people who like FOI. Um, and we only got 15% of the data that we asked for, like 15% worth of councils gave us the data, which is a bit annoying. Uh, but we made this nonetheless. Uh, basically, if we didn't have the data, it would say, here's your council phone number. You should go and do it. But if it did work, it would look something like this, where you could say, it's not very easy to understand, but like this is where you live, and this is where your polling station is. Um, and it would give you Google walking directions and that kind of stuff. But this is more of a kind of proof of concept of here's where we should be. If, if this data was available, if the council's made it freely available, you can make tools like this. And like lots of councils make their own tool on their own website for it. But one of the problems is if you don't know who your council are, or like if you don't, if you don't in any way engage with the state, but you just heard on the news that you have to go and vote, and like you registered on GovUK, but GovUK doesn't tell you anything more than just where to register and like you're not taught it's just like, kind of broken like if you were to do it as a, as a kind of service design it, it would just leave you hanging all over the place um, so a centralized place to find out where your, account, where your polling station is regardless of who your council is and without you having to know anything more than what your postcode is is there's a kind of good case for that right <laughs> this is my controversial statement um, the open data isn't enough so a lot of councils already have polling station data on Data.gov UK, but that sitting there didn't help anyone find out where to vote, right? I mean, like, probably this is, you know, it's semi-controversial, like, it's a conversation starter, but um, let's start with the user need of, like, let's find the polling station. And as soon as we explained that to a load of the councils, they suddenly were really on board with understanding why they needed to open this data up, right? So, like, let's use that as a turn it round. Um, you can imagine, like, the, 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 the open data is a tool for doing that. It's not the solution in itself. And uh, perhaps no one's saying it's the solution itself, but there's lots of people who just say, sort of like, oh, the solution to fixing loads of government stuff is to open the data. Actually, if you end up with 450 differently formatted, fragmented data sets on Data.gov UK, that's not actually going to help anyone. So, like, I, I, I kind of want to find ways of making opening the data just a part of fixing the user need rather than, rather than being the solution. Uh, like I say, it's deliberately controversial and maybe arguing against the straw man, but there's Q and A's, right? So like, this is what it's for. <laughs> um, oh yeah, and the fragmented data bit, like 
there's loads of problems that we have where 450 councils manage a thing and they do it slightly differently and people have tried to solve it so like openly local tried to solve it and it's just really difficult maintaining updated data sets from all of these councils i really want to figure out a way of solving that fragmentation somehow um while still maintaining local councils probably you know it's kind of difficult right so next steps democracy isn't about elections it's about everything else in between elections um the the 7th of May this year was about the only day that you have a really good answer to the question, how do I engage with the state? Uh, but on every other day, like, how do I engage with the state in a meaningful way that's going to like make things happen in the way that I think they should happen? Um, it's kind of hard to answer that question any other day of the year, and I want to try and do that. So there's this idea of the do something dashboard, which is literally what can I do right now? You know, put in my postcode maybe, or just and here's a list of things that you can do. And maybe you care about these five topics, so we'll try and match the things you can do to the topics you care about, maybe not. Um, some people do this already, like my society's tools are really good at sort of taking a little nibble into this. Um, fix My Street is, there's nearly always something you can do on Fix My Street just by going for a walk or whatever. Uh, and then we get into these other kind of fragmented data sets like council meetings, how do you figure out when the next council meeting is or when your next MP surgery is or loads of other things you might want to do, but it's kind of hard to discover them. So that's, that's the discovery phase of the decent dashboard. And the, like, the really final thing is uh, let's not make people understand the country's org chart in order to interact with it. So Westminster MPs only have a certain remit. They don't do bin collection. They don't really do like European staff or international staff in the same way as we think about them. They are influential in that way, but they don't really, you know, your, your Westminster MP isn't responsible for immigrants coming to your street if that's what you care about, right? They can't really do much about it. Uh, same way councils can't do things. So the things you care about really might not map onto the way that you understand the country to be run. Um, and like really, how many people here really understand exactly what it is their district council does or their, or their city council does or the council? Like, what is their remit? What do they do? Um, Let's figure that out, and let's not figure that out by teaching the whole country what the council's remit is. Let's figure it out by just saying, here's a problem I've got. Help me fix it. And then somebody is in government to fix that. So that's all I've got. Please like 